The following presentation was part of a forum entitled Impacts of Gas Drilling with High Volume Hydrofracking. The forum was held at the High School Auditorium in Trumansburg, New York on December 8, 2010, and sponsored by the following organizations, the Ulysses Gas Drilling Advisory Board, the Coalition to Protect New York, and the Committee to Preserve the Finger Lakes. Our next presenter is Helen Slotchy. Um, Helen is a senior attorney at the nonprofit law firm Community Environmental De Defense Council in Ithaca. Helen attended the University of P Pennsylvania and Harvard Law Schools. With expertise in environmental and oil and gas law, Helen works with citizen groups and municipalities that want to protect their rural landscape from industrialization associated with gas drilling. She lives in Ithaca. So hi, thanks again uh, for all of you for coming out tonight. It's so cold I'd rather be home in front of a fire or something, but uh, unfortunately duty calls for many of us, and uh, so thank you and thanks to everyone who worked so hard on getting this organized and uh, getting such a great group of speakers and audience members to come uh, tonight, including, uh, I see lots of local elected officials and county officials and officials from other states, and that's terrific. One of the things uh, that we'll talk a little bit about in a minute is sort of enacting some change at the local level, so it's very nice to see that they've made the time to come out here this evening. So we've heard a little bit about some of the issues that unconventional drilling brings from the disruption of pipelines and access roads to air pollution. Um, we haven't talked too much about climate change, but that's a really big problem from all of the methane emissions and the like to the extent that that pushes us towards a tipping point in climate change. And um, the idea of, uh, I really like the visual of the cocktail straws of abandoned wells as portals for pollution. So, um, so then, you, you know, so what, what can we do? Are we really simply at the mercy of the oil and gas drilling companies? Who can we turn to? So you might think, well, the federal government will save us. Um, not really. And so um, I wanted to go a bit through sort of some of the traditional environmental laws that are out there and why uh, they're not going to work. So there's the Safe Drinking Water Act, as you might imagine, that's supposed to protect drinking water. and. Um, so that's been around since 1972 and did in fact apply to the gas drilling companies um, from 1987. Um, well, actually, the, the Safe Drinking Water Act did not technically apply. There was a, a federal lawsuit brought. Uh, it looked like uh, fracking was going to be covered under the Safe Drinking Water Act. So the oil and gas industry marched off to Congress, met with Dick Cheney, and got their celebrated Halliburton loophole whereby the injection of chemicals uh, from fracking and the like are not considered, are just not regulated under uh, the underground injection control rules. Um, so then we have the Clean Water Act, you know, graciously brought to us in 1972. And the gas industry was covered under that from 1987 to 2005. Um, as far as having to receive permits for um, s soil and water and sedimentation erosion. And in 2005, as part of uh, Dick Cheney's master plan, uh, the industry did receive an exemption for sediment uh, discharges. And, um, and then if you thought maybe the fracking fluids might be considered a pollutant, well, no, we just define those to not be a pollutant. Uh, we do that a lot in Washington, apparently. Uh, RICRA is the Resource Recovery and, uh, RICRA, Resource Recovery, and, I don't know, Resource Con Conservation Act or something. That's the basic cradle to grave uh, program and set up in 1976. In 1988, is when uh, the industry received an exemption there. And basically they just decided that it didn't matter what the waste was really made up of, it mattered how you made the waste. So if you made the waste in oil and gas activities, 
Well, it's magically solid waste. It's not a hazardous waste. Um, it's just one you can take to the Shemung landfill. They're glad to have it there. Um, and why did the EPA decide to exempt the oil and gas industry and just make this characterization of their waste as just solid waste? Well, the compliance costs were too high, and it was going to be too complex to regulate. So we might as well just not regulate it at all. Um, so there's CERCLA, which is the comprehensive environmental, you know, whatever, super fund to the rest of us. And um, that liability, you can be liable under, uh, under uh, CERCLA um, if you release hazardous substances. Well, guess what? 1980, the definition of hazardous substance does not include oil and gas industry products. So uh, 1972, we have the Clean Air Act, and we have never regulated oil and gas activities under the Clean Air Act. They're not regulated collectively as a major source. They're not regulated as combined small area sources. You can't aggregate them. Uh, so there's just no coverage whatsoever under the Clean Air Act. Uh, NEPA is the National Environmental Policy Act. It's the equivalent, this, the original state or federal version of what we have in New York State as seeker. And uh, there's a, basically a categorical exclusion in 2005 to any analysis of the environmental impacts from leasing uh, forest lands, uh, United States lands and the like. And there's never been uh, a NEPA analysis required for uh, BLM lands, the lands that the government owns out west. So what about the Community Right to Know Act? Nope, totally exempt since 1986 from having to report to communities the nature of the chemicals that they use. And in fact, all of these exemptions are really subsidies. The cost doesn't go away just because we define something differently or we choose not to regulate it. All of these pollutants that enter into the atmosphere and the ground and, and the like, they're still there. They haven't been disposed of in any sort of meaningful, uh, modestly protective way. We don't even track what they are, which I'll get to in just a second. But, but those really, the exemptions don't make the cost go away. They just mean that we have to pay for it, whether it's in terms of health care costs or um, sick days from work or poor land values, the inability to attract new industry to certain places that have been destroyed uh, by these sort of activities. Um, but again, those costs, not borne by industry, but, but still in effect. So maybe our state will help us out. So we have um, the Division of Mineral Resources here in uh, New York. And um, we basically enacted our oil and gas regulations in 1963. They were revised in 1981 um, to enhance the revenue that was uh, produced uh, from the regulatory scheme. Sometime in the mid-80s, they started uh, the generic environmental impact statement for gas wells. They finished that in 1992. We could only hope that the uh, supplemental generic impact statement takes 12 years. Um, so, but in 1994, right on the heels of what should have then been the brand new generic impact statement, industry sent a group out to evaluate our state's regulations. It's uh, a group that's now called STRONGER, which stands for, I don't know, uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's called STRONGER, something like state, you know, regulation improvements, and it's run by uh, the, International, the uh, Interstate Oil and Gas uh, Commission. Their first finding, the Department of Mineral Rules required substantial upgrading. Their second finding, one of the principal stated missions of the DEC is the protection of human health and the environment. However, their regulations don't include the protection of human health or the environment as a goal or a policy directive. This is industry making these findings. Finding three, greater coordination is needed to gather data on uh, exploration and production waste and to ensure that this waste is appropriately managed. 
They go on with lots of problems with the waste project. Their tenth finding, the Division of Mineral Resources cannot meet its program responsibilities and effectively administer its program with current funding. So um, not one single recommendation from the 1994 review has been implemented. So industry itself, while they may now say, uh, presumably because it is uh, helpful to them, that New York has the strongest regulations around. An industry review in 1994 said no, and we haven't done one single thing since then except start work on a supplement to a document that they thought was insufficient at that time. So uh, in part, uh, not too much changed because um, in starting in 1992, the state had a substantial decline in production of oil and gas, and it wasn't financially worth really spending a lot of money and time on an industry that looked like it was going to go away. So, um, so it's really difficult. Uh, oh, and the other thing is that um, we talk about regulations, but there really aren't any regulations in New York. There's a few pages of, of, of actual regulations, but the permitting re relies entirely on permit conditions. So there, it's simply each time that they issue a permit, they come up with the then permit conditions, but they, they do not want to have any regulations. The De Department of Mineral Resources does not desire, does not want to have any standing regulations. They want to have it completely at their discretion to come up with the permit conditions for each and every well so that there's no ability of people on the outside to say, A, why isn't this a condition of this permit? And B, it's very difficult to keep track of sort of what the individual permit conditions are at each individual well site. So while the state could regulate it, they really um, have chosen not to do so. So some people say, all right, we'll the DEC is not going to regulate it. The EPA is not going to regulate it. We're going to write a lease, and that's going to fix all our problems. And um, having been before getting involved in this, I went to a, I started out with this. I went to a meeting in Dan because I thought I might like to learn a bit more about a year and a half ago, almost two years ago. I mentioned to someone I was a lawyer, and that was the end of that. Um, I've been working on this uh, with groups ever since. But before that, before we moved out here, I was a real estate lawyer and drafted lots of leases, air rights leases, commercial leases, residential leases, um, you know, all sorts of different things. And a lease is a piece of paper. And in this sort of instance, it's my opinion that what you get when you sign a lease is you're buying a lawsuit. And um, You'll hear from the Sautners, their, their lease says that their water supply will be, you know, will be fixed if uh, anything goes wrong. The DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection in Pennsylvania, has told Cabot that they need to replace the water supply by virtue of a pipeline. And Cabot told the DEP pardon my, to go to hell, that they weren't going to do it. And um, so that's a company talking to the, the regulators. As an individual landowner, your possibility of obtaining relief in an individual case when they won't do what the DEP, they said, the DEP just didn't even tell them to do it. They agreed they would do this. And then they were like, oh, well, we changed our mind. Um, and they, what's really entertaining is that they're claiming that there was undue influence and they were pressured into signing this. They've never let a single person out of a lease for, you know, that claims perhaps somewhat more truly that they didn't know what they were signing and it wasn't fair. Um, but they would very much like to be and, and intend uh, now with the political change in Pennsylvania to be released from this obligation. So, um, you know, and then there's things even we talked a bit about earlier. Uh, Lou mentioned some of the landowner coalition leases. I had a chance to look at the Friendsville lease. They have what looks to be a really strong environmental uh, hazardous waste um, indemnification provision, except they use the definitions from the federal laws. 
So everything that they defined, so hazardous substances, hazardous release, a CERCLA event, there is no such thing. So they've actually, in my opinion, they're worse off uh, now having signed that indemnity than they would have been without any indemnity at all um, because they've effectively said that the, that, that, the, that the company is only liable for these sort of events and, uh, and those definitions wholesalely exclude oil and gas exploration and production waste. So um, as one of my favorite people, Ken Zesserson, who's here tonight, says, when you make a deal with the devil, you're always the junior partner. Um, so I would, uh, so making a lease uh, doesn't really seem to be like the, it's better. I mean, there are certainly leases that are better than others, but um, I would think that the, the best idea of all is to not sign a lease in the first place. So, which leads us to compulsory integration, another favorite topic, um, and one that industry here likes to use as a, uh, a bit of a sledgehammer for people that if you don't sign a lease, you know, you can wind up being integrated. No one has brought any such challenge yet, uh, but we believe that in a compulsory integration situation with a shale formation where the gas is not migratory, it's not in a pool or reservoir, but is rather more like a mineral and locked in place, that the previous basis for compulsory integration correlative rights, which basically says if there's this big pool, it's under my yard, it's under your yard, you're going to put a, a straw into that pool and you're going to suck it all out instead of me putting a straw in on my side and competing to see who can suck more gas out faster, we'll just put one straw in and we'll split it and that will be fair. So that's what correlative rights is about. They use that for compulsory integration. They say if, you know, the person over here signed a lease, you didn't sign a lease, you didn't have to, we're going to let them take all the gas out and we'll give you your share. Well, you don't need to do that with gas that's trapped in the rock. And in fact, you can't simply extract gas from under the, the one property that hasn't signed a lease from the property that did sign the lease without a physical invasion under the land that didn't sign the lease and the injection and leaving of chemicals under that person's land in an, in an environment where you can't say and don't know what's going to happen to those chemicals. And the current compulsory integration scheme offers no compensation for that physical trespass because it previously assumed that the only, uh, that there was no physical trespass, there was simply a ex negative pressure on the other person's property that caused the gas that was fugitive to migrate. And you didn't own it anyways and they're just being sports letting you have some of the profit. So completely uh, different circumstance with shale formations, physical invasion and the like. So um, that's another lawsuit that's out there for sale. Um, there's been a little bit in the papers these days about anticipatory nuisance as a claim. Uh, that's a little bit more problematic in New York at this time. Um, what, so before you can get to anticipatory nuisance, there's what's a nuisance in the first place. So there's generally this common law right to peacefully enjoy your property. And the general rule is that uh, you have the right to control and possess your property, but you do not have the right to make an unreasonable use of your property that substantially interferes with your neighbor's right to peacefully enjoy and use their property. So a nuisance is when there's a substantial interference that's intentional and unreasonable with a person's right to use and enjoy their land caused by the person conducting the nuisance. So you really have to, and the courts engage in balancing, and they look at the extent of the harm, the character of the harm, the social value of the person who's uh, creating what's alleged to be a nuisance. And generally, lawful business can't be a nuisance per se. It can be a nuisance if improperly conducted, but typically an activity that's conducted and permitted and is occurring in the nature 
as the government intended this use to occur um, may or may not be a nuisance, but usually uh, it would be very difficult under the present scheme in New York to say that, that a, another, that a neighbor didn't have the right to even begin the, you know, that even by uh, leasing their property without any activity there, um, that that's a nuisance. As the case law develops as more cases of water contamination and the like wind their way through the courts and uh, there are findings of, and, and there are in fact documented cases of water contamination that presently we don't have because in the past industry has been able to buy off people that had uh, water contamination problems and so Sotners will tell you it's difficult when you don't have any water and the only people that will give you the water are the people that want you to shut up and not talk about it. So, um, so that is out there. I don't think it's a real sort of cure-all, but uh, one area where we do feel like there is some real hope for uh, towns and municipalities is to exert some, some local control over this. And industry in the DEC will say, well, you can't regulate this. Exactly. We don't want to regulate this. We just want to prohibit it. And <laughs> so we believe uh, looking at the definitions and case law on regulating and that being of the operation and process of drilling versus a land use based uh, plan for a community that says we want our land available for agriculture and we want clean water and we value any number of other things and we don't want surface disturbance and we don't want light and noise pollution and you look at sort of real traditional zoning type issues as compared to even um, so that you're not regulating the process that that is not a regulation of the industry. That's a local land use um, regulation that's not preempted. And there is a court of appeals, which is the highest court in the state of New York case law, um, both in the mining context as well as with alcoholic beverage licensing, where the fact that you have either a or could receive a permit from the state to mine, or you could receive a permit from the state to operate uh, a, an alcoholic beverage uh, facility that if the land use planning in that community says no you cannot do this that that is not a regulation of either of those industries as as one put it uh, the court put it alcohol is not land um, so so that we believe is sort of the strongest uh, path for communities to follow that we can't really rely on the feds to regulate this. We can't rely on the state to regulate it. And while at the local level we can't regulate it, we can't put conditions, we can't, um, once you allow the use, you can't get into the process and the operation. You have to let it be. But if you don't allow it, that simply prohibiting it um, through local land use law um, would appear to be the strongest option. And so for that effort here in Ulysses, um, some citizens started a petition to show um, they didn't really know back in August that um, there was going to be sort of what the community support would be. The, the town board people didn't know. No one had really thought of this before. And the people in the town weren't sure what other people would think. So they decided they'd start a petition drive, uh, sort of this random ad hoc grassroots group uh, that they'd start this petition drive and see what happened. And um, they've had overwhelming positive support. If you live in Ulysses, there are uh, people here accepting signatures on the petition uh, tonight. Uh, Judy Abrams is in the back holding up a petition. Um, so, and they've had great luck with that so far. I think they're close to 1,000 signatures of, uh, of residents. So, and I think I heard that something like 1,300 people voted in the last election. So it would look like this is a strong enough block uh, 
to sort of have some political measure in the town. And um, so that's one thing communities can do is to see sort of what the, the political, you know, different communities are going to have different opinions about this. And, you know, I wouldn't necessarily want to go to Spencer and start a petition drive today. I mean, maybe a year from now or 18 months, things might have changed and there'll be more information. But there certainly seem to be communities in our region here in Tompkins County where there is the political will for this. So working with local groups, trying to assess uh, what the, the status is in your town, both attending local educational events, trying to host them. There's been a, a group, uh, Coalition to Protect New York, that's been trying to help local groups with um, setting up forums very close uh, to localities so that they people didn't have to travel to somewhere else and it was really based for that uh, that community. I can't promise that your community will have Sandra uh, the happening to live there, um, but uh, you know, plenty of communities here have some really involved individuals and, um, and there is a whole host of sort of speakers bureau type people out there that will come and give presentations. Letters to the editor, sort of getting the message out there. Industry has um, a dedicated, highly paid media campaign in addition to lobbying and everything else. And they're very good at getting their message out there about a clean transition fuel and the like and working to and having letters, you know, not just from the same people, but questioning the concept of it being a cleaner burning fuel that Bob Howarth, uh, also from Ulysses, you guys are a standout, um, have, uh, you know, he's done some terrific work on the true carbon footprint of methane and whether natural gas extraction is going to push us over a tipping point. The idea of the bridge fuel is really because, as it's been said, this isn't, um, you know, you can't be a little bit fracked, that uh, you have to have this whole build out of pipelines and access roads and water withdrawal points and well pads that um, is that really a, a transition to anything or I mean hydraulic fracturing was invented because George Mitchell in Texas had a burnt out oil field and he, there was nothing left to extract from it so he spent 10 years thinking and thinking how can I put my leases, my well pads, my pipelines into production and he developed hydro hydraulic fracturing. So it's not industry's nature to sort of walk away after 10 years and say, oh, we're so glad we've like been your bridge fuel, you know, now we'll let you do something else. Um, I don't think that that's the intent at all. I think it detracts us from the idea of moving towards renewable futures, uh, renewable fuels. It ties up land from being able to be used for wind or other type uh, fuel productions. So getting the message out there in letters to the editors. And then finally, attending local town board meetings to the extent that you aren't actively engaged in your town uh, meetings and at least making your wishes and, and desires known repeatedly. Town boards have very little capacity, you know, uh, sort of one budget crisis to the next. Uh, from a generally volunteer group of people. So if you're not there sort of meeting after meeting, making what you want done known, uh, you sort of can't blame anybody if it doesn't get done. So, so all of those things, local groups, educational events, letters to the editor, going out into your uh, communities and trying to talk to your neighbors and find out if they'll sign a petition or not and what you might be able to do would all be great ways to just say no. So thank you very much.